It's time to redefine reality. This is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. Welcome back, Welcome back. to Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. Ladies and gentlemen, the captain has turned on the fasten seatbelt sign. We're now crossing a zone of turbulence. Please return your seats and food trays to their upright position and make sure your carry-on luggage is safely stowed. You're about to leave everything you know behind. This is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. Strange Planet. Richard Serrett on Zoomer Radio. Hey, thanks for inviting me into your home, your long-haul truck, RV, camper, taxi, your parents' well-appointed basement with the simulated wood paneling, electric fireplace, and the painting of dogs playing poker, your loft, that greasy spoon just off the interstate, and your cabin in the woods. Film historian, author, theologian, lawyer, 32nd degree Mason, Robert W. Sullivan IV is here this hour to delve into occult symbolism in popular Hollywood movies and sometimes not big Hollywood blockbusters or or popcorn movies. Sometimes he talks about the occultic subtext in small but popular independent films and even foreign films. Previously uh, on this program and uh, on Coast to Coast, when uh, Robert has joined me on that program, uh, he's discussed the Gnostic films of the late 90s and early 2000s like The Matrix, Dark City, Fight Club, the Truman Show, uh, Donnie Darko, Vanilla Sky, films embedded with Gnostic symbology are, are characterized by things like false realities, expanding consciousness, uh, characters manipulated by a puppet master. Uh, but Gnostic symbology is uh, is is uh, an esoteric, or not the only type of esoteric meanings encoded in movies. There's numerology, uh, Masonic symbology, there's Christian symbology. Uh, if you've never heard Robert W. Sullivan the Fourth, you are in for a treat, and I guarantee you'll never watch movies the same way again. You'll constantly be hitting the pause and rewind. And what was that I just saw in the corner of the screen? Robert W. Sullivan the Fourth, historian, philosopher, antiquarian, jurist, lay theologian, writer, mystic, radio, TV personality, best-selling author, CEO, uh, and lawyer. He's the author of five books: The Royal Arch of Enoch. Cinema Symbolisms 1, 2, and 3, and A Pact with the Devil. The latter is a work of fiction. And uh, always a delight to welcome Robert back to the program. Hey, Robert, how are you? Hey, Richard. Thanks for having me on The Conspiracy Show. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, my pleasure. Uh, so um, the uh, the latest volume, I know that you're, um, you're working on Cinema Symbolism 4. Uh, when can we expect that? That's still going to be a little ways off. Um, there's movies that I actually want to analyze or at least look at uh, that I have yet to see, um, such as like the, the, the latest Matrix movie. And uh, I know uh, Ghostbusters Afterlife. I know Ghostbusters comes out on Blu-ray on Tuesday. You know, it's, it's going to be a while. It's, uh, it's going to be at least a year or two before that comes out. Um, I'm also making some edits to some of my other books. So uh, probably at least a year or two, I would say, before... Uh, Cinema symbolism before hits the uh, hits the street. All right. Well, if uh, people have some catching up to do, if they haven't read Cinema Symbolism one, two, and three, so by the time they work their way through those, uh, then hopefully Cinema Symbolism will be four will be ready. How many films do you watch in a year? Oh, good grief! I I, I don't know. Um, I usually go through a slate of movies that I I want to see. I mean, well, a lot of times. Um, if I'm working, when you say how many movies do I watch, it's too hard. It's too hard to, for me to estimate. Um, I mean, I do have a day job also. Um, like when, if I'm editing or working, um, and I just sometimes in the background, if there's nothing on TV, I'll just throw a movie on that I'm just kind of like you know passively watching, paying attention to. Um, so I don't know if that really counts. Um, you know, how many new movies, like movies that I've never seen before. You know, again, it just depends. Um, you know, I, I just watched uh, the the two that I just watched that came out in the theater a few months ago were um, uh, uh, Halloween Kills and The Last Night in Soho and Dune. I, I should add that in. I just saw Dune as well. Um, this is the 2021 version, not the 1984 version. With um, Steve, I right. Yeah, and I, I, liked, I liked all of them. Um, I thought they were all very, very well done. Um, you know, definitely worthy of analysis. I guess Dune, Dune is sort of like, you know, the, the David Lynch version. 
Um, I mean, it's the Campbell monument. They left out some stuff that I thought would have been in, and then they put some stuff in that I thought maybe they could have left out. But all in all, I, I very much liked uh, the new Dune. Last night in Soho, um, it's interesting. That's Edgar Wright. Uh, that has a, a, a very um, latent alchemical storyline around one of the characters. Um, and Halloween Kills, um, you got a lot of uh, um, role reversal, yeah. homages in that one, Easter eggs, um, like the last one was, like two, Halloween 2018 was. So, you know, those are ones that I really, I really enjoyed and I thought were, you know, if I do, when I do CS4, I'll make sure they go in. Um, and like I said, the, the next one's up that I, I want to see, uh, I want to see the latest Ghostbusters movie, which is due out Tuesday on Blu-ray, and then the next Matrix movie, which I think is due out in March. Right. Now, uh, and we'll, we'll come back to Hollywood Kills because Mike Myers strikes again. Um, he just won't stay down. He will not stay down. We'll come back and talk about some of the, uh, the symbology there. But let me just, I want people to get a sense of how you work. So do you watch typically, when you watch a movie and you say, oh, I, 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 there's a lot of stuff happening here. I'm going to go back and watch it again. Like you watch it all the way through from beginning to end. And then you go back and and then, you know, you hit that pause and rewind and you start taking notes. Is that how it works? Yeah, that, that that's pretty much it. Usually the first time I watch it is for just entertainment value, just to see if I like the movie, you know, just just to watch it just for kicks. Um, usually, even when I'm doing that, though, I pick up on some stuff, you know, to kind of make mental notes of. Um, and yeah, it's absolutely. I mean, I, I usually when I sit down to really pick it apart, you know, when, when I when I reach that stage, um, like I haven't watched, I haven't done that with Halloween Kills yet. I mean, I've watched it two or three, four times, but I haven't made notes on it. I mean, I could certainly talk about it, but when, when I reach the point where I'm going to write about it, then I'll sit down there and sit down and watch it with a notepad, you know, making notes or even the computer on making notes on, you know, on the document, um, what I want to talk about in the film, um, you know, what, what I saw going on, um, things like that. And, and that, again, that can happen on any one of, 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 of a viewing, usually after the first one. I never do it on the first viewing. Um, it's usually the second or third one um, that I do it on, but only when I'm ready to analyze it. Um, you know, I, I haven't, I, I, with Cinema Symbolism 4, I've just outlined it. Um, I mean, when I say I have outlined it, I've made notes of what movies I want to put in and some some salient points here and there. Right. Uh, but I actually haven't done any full full blown analysis of like Halloween Kills. But I mean, if you ask me about it, I can certainly talk about it. Okay, so uh, again, there may be people joining us who haven't heard uh, from you before, and so I want to give them the sense how this works. I mentioned uh, Gnostic symbolism, and I mentioned uh, just you know recounting some of our earlier conversations. So this is sort of your work. I'm I'm parroting here, but uh, Gnostic symbol symbolism in these movies there there are you know false realities. There's expanded consciousness. There's you know puppets being controlled by masters, and I mentioned. Uh, I mentioned uh, The Matrix, and I mentioned Truman, The Truman Show, and Donnie Darko, and Vanilla Sky, and so forth. Um, what else What else can you tell us about Gnostic symbology? Like, what do you look for, and you can say, ah, this is a Gnostic, this is a Gnostic film? Yeah, I mean, you, you hit some of them. I mean, not all those elements are always present. Um, it, it's, again, when, uh, like, a, like you said, I mean, you, you got it right on uh the, the false reality or a multiple uh, or a multiverse where there's one reality that may be true and one reality that may be fake we find that in vanilla sky we find that in the truman show we find that in the matrix um you know is there a creator of the false illusion um as there is in the truman show um you know with christoph which is the ed harris character um that would be that would be you know th th that's a hallmark of a gnostic film we you know the uh the one that's another one that's similar to this is like Snowpiercer, um, and and again one one element um, that I would add in that's in Snowpiercer is, is there's always um, a lot of times there's like a you know it's what Campbell calls the road of trials. There's like a like a series of progressions um, that the character, the protagonist or protagonist have to make um, in order to reach their final uh, you know objective, which is kind of like you know enlightenment, uh, a Gnostic epiphany. Um, you know, Truman has to fight his way out of Sea Haven uh, in, in, in Snowpiercer, um, which is another one of these. And again, what's funny with Snowpiercer is Ed Harris played the Demiurge again in that one, uh, where the characters are making their way through the train cars, which are sort of these simulated realities um, up to the very front of the car, which is where the creator, cre creator dwells. 
and the idea and Dorothy Gale in the Wizard of Oz, you know, the trials that she's going through with uh, in, in, in Oz with the monkeys and the, the flying monkeys and the trees throwing the apples and the poppy fields, you know, and confronting the wizard. Um, these are what you could call like levels or tests of spiritual purification that the character or characters are going through to ultimately reach their goal. This reflects <clears throat> the, the, this reflects a lot of ancient doctrines that run parallel. Um, this is, is Gnostic. In, in Gnosticism, they're called the seven governors. It's these levels of what you'd call super celestial purification um, that the soul goes on after death to reach the higher Godhead. Um, but of course, we find this in mundane reality as well. Um, and and it's, par it's, it's, it's parodied. It, 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 you find it in Kabbalah with the Sephirah. It's the same sort of thing. So inevitably, a lot of times with these Gnostic films, you're, you'll find these sort of road of trials, levels of spiritual pur purification that the character, although the character remains alive, it's these sort of tests of integrity, of, uh, of, of, of ch challenges, if you will, that purify, um, that prepare the character for the ultimate revelation at the end. Um, and you'll find those in Gnostic films as well. Um, and again, this runs, runs parallel with Kabbalistic imagery. You mentioned Campbell, meaning Joseph Campbell, the power of myth. Um, we, we remember that terrific series on PBS. I, I know also uh, you, you're heavily steeped in Carl Jung and Jungian symbology. But for the directors that make these movies, are they likewise steeped in Campbell and, and Jung? Or do they, do they un, maybe not fully understand what they're doing, that it's maybe it's embedded in their own subconscious and it comes out on the screen? Right. It, it's a great question. And it, the answer is it's, it's, it's all of that. Um, I mean, you definitely have directors who know what they're doing, who, um, you know, uh, know, are familiar with Campbell um, or are familiar with Young. And they, all, and they openly admit to this. Um, uh, I, forget, I forget who it was. I believe it was Richard Kelly and Donnie Darko was talking about. Uh, it was a documentary that he had made or it may have been, it may have been um, the director's cut where he was doing the narration over it. Um, when he was talking, he, he starts talking about Joseph Campbell and how this element was here and this element was here. Um, he talks about threshold guardians, things like that. Um, so again, it just depends on the level of, the, of sophistication of the filmmaker. Um, some are very cognizant of it and encode it, and know what they're doing. Um, some some of it is subconscious, and you know maybe where the filmmaker. Um, you know, wasn't fully aware, but was putting in anyway. And then there's the sort of the hybrid of both where the filmmaker is implanting, you know, hidden Easter eggs or, you know, the Campbell monomyth or, or, or symbolism in film, and they encode another layer that they may not even be aware of. Um, so, so you have, you, you know, it's, 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 you got three of them, really. It's, it's the one where, you know, you know where, where you have the sophisticated filmmaker who is encoding it and you can pick up on it. Then you have, you know, the filmmaker, you know, who it turns up in their film, but maybe they weren't really aware of it. It's just part of the creative process, part of the storytelling. And then there's sort of a hybrid one where you definitely have the filmmaker encoding the occult symbolism, but maybe adding more than they're even aware of. Um, so, so you have all of that. And, each, and, and the one thing that I always talk about is each movie has to be looked at individually. Um, you can't paint with broad strokes when you do this. Um, a symbol in one movie may mean something in, you know, in something in another movie, but something entirely different. And the way you figure that out is uh, the context in which it's presented, the surrounding circumstances, the surrounding imagery, uh, the surrounding plot, uh, you know, the characters, what's going on in the film. Uh, something that's occurring in one movie could have, you know, called meaning, um, but that doesn't mean it necessarily transfers when you see it in another movie. It could likewise have esoteric meaning. But it just may be something different depending on the surrounding circumstances. And and why so many Gnostic films came out in that period of the late '90s and the early 2000s? Was it just the zeitgeist? Uh, what, what what why did they come out at that period? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it is. It, it seems to me to to be some sort of subconscious, um, you know, Jungian synchronicity where it was just the turn of the millennium. Um, you know the the. the, the the, the, the turnover, you know, maybe from, you could say, one solar age to another, from Pisces to Aquarius, who knows? But you did. You, you just had this rash of Gnostic films coming out. And I'm not sure why, um, but I mean, it's definitely there. I, I find it hard to believe that these producers were sitting around talking to one another in these movie studios saying, oh, well, let's just do this um, all at once. I, I really don't believe that. But 
nevertheless, you did have, um, you know, starting around 1997 or so up to around 2002. I mean, th this is where all the great Gnostic movies come out of is this five year time frame. And it, it's, you know, it's the ones we always wind up talking about. The Truman Show, The Matrix, Donnie Darko, the ones you mentioned, Vanilla Sky, Existence, uh, you know, uh, what's the so, other one in there? D Dark City. Uh, that's right. Another one. Right. So is that why uh, I, I, I haven't seen it? I don't know that I'll get around to seeing it, but the latest Matrix film, people are saying it's not very good. Is that because it just it's not for the times? Yeah, it, 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 it very well could be. I have yet to see it, um, so I, I really can't comment on it. I heard the same. I heard what you heard. I heard it wasn't very good also. Um, the only thing I, I mean, the only thing I can relate to the movie, and again, I have not seen it, so I'm just going on the marketing that I've seen for it, it struck me as sort of like a parallel dimension type movie. Um, but again, this is just based on the marketing. I have not seen Masic Resurrection, so I'm just speculating on that. Because um, a lot of times the marketing can be somewhat a little misleading, um, and sometimes a lot misleading. I just watched the one that I, 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 the latest one I watched was Last Night in Soho, which I liked very much. But the, the marketing for it presented it as a time travel movie. Um, and it's really not. It's, it's, it has a time travel element, but the protagonist in it is not Marty McFly or Bill and Ted or anyone like that. The movie is really a, a horror suspense thriller murder mystery. Uh, and, you know, when I sat down and watched it for the first time, I thought I was watching going to be watching a time travel movie. And it wasn't at all. Um, I mean, great that there are scenes that take place in the past. And there's, a you know, where the one girl goes back in time in the past. But she's more of a passive observer. Um, when I watched The Matrix uh, marketing, um, it struck me as more of a parallel, uh, sort of almost like a Mandela effect type movie, where it's like a parallel universe bleeding into another reality. Uh, less, less Gnostic. But again, I have yet to see the movie, so I'm just speculating on the marketing. If I, if I um, asked you to give us, in your estimation, a quintessential movie uh, that has alchemical symbology first explain very quickly what alchemical symbology what that means alchemical and then give us sort of maybe one right. or two movies right sure sure um the the well it's it's a complex um question because alchemical has numerous meanings um what i usually when i say alchemical i'm usually talking about psychological or spiritual alchemy of course there's alchemy there's alchemy alchemy where it's about you know turning base metal into gold um if you want to watch a movie on that, you know, the actual, you know, process, look, take a look at James Bond Goldfinger, um, where the guy is trying to manipulate the gold supply, manipulate the metal in Fort Knox for economic purposes. So, I mean, that's alchemy, um, you know, in Goldfinger, the, you know, the golden touch, um, you have the, you know, the philosopher's stone there with the dirty bomb. That's, you know, an alchemical movie where you actually have the manipulation of the metal into something else for economic advantage. It's the Golden Fort Knox where he's going to try to make it radioactive, um, change it, alter it in order to make his gold supply worth more money. So if you want to watch a pure alchemical movie, that would be it. For the, for the psychological, um, spiritual alchemy, where, when, when I talk about this, this is where you have a character who starts as one thing and winds up by the end of the movie has transformed into something else. Uh, they've undergone a change. This sort of runs parallel with Gnosticism um, because the Renaissance alchemists took their ideas from the Gnostics, but it's a fine line, it's hair splitting. The Gnostic film delves into the awakening of the character. They're pretty much the same character at the end. I think Dorothy Gale or Alice in Alice in Wonderland, um, but they, they're wiser, they're just better off. They're a smarter iteration of their earlier version. This is not so with the alchemical movie where the character starts at one thing and then by the end of it is something completely different for, for various reasons. Our examples of that, um, I would have uh, the, the three that come to mind, and it's the one I'll bring up again, would be a movie like Black Swan, where the ballerina starts off as sort of this, you know, melancholy, frustrated, down, down and out ballerina. And by the end of it, she's this monster. She's transformed into something else. Um, the Shining uh, with Jack Nicholson, again, where he starts as, um, the failed writer, and by the end of the movie, he's the psychotic killer. But that's an alchemical transition. That's an alchemical movie. And the one that I just I just mentioned, Last Night in Soho, um, the character of um, the Anya Taylor-Joy character, not the other one, 
Um, the Anya Taylor, Taylor Joy chemical character, I don't want to give too much of it away because it just it came out of the Blu-ray. She, she goes through an alchemical process. She starts off at the beginning as one thing, and by the end, she's something completely different. So if, if right, right off the bat, if you ask me to name three alchemical movies um, where you're dealing with the psychological, spiritual alchemy, um, I, I would go with Black Swan, The Shining, and Last Night at Soho. Uh, we're coming up on a break here. I'll, I'll start sure. this conversation now, and then we'll pick it up on the other side as well. Robert W. Sullivan IV is with us. Cinema Symbolisms, one uh, volumes one through three, and he's working on uh, volume four. Uh, numerology. Uh, I mean, there are movies that are overtly about numerology, like uh, the number 23, that Jim Carrey movie, which uh, I think that came around out in uh, like mid-2000s or something, which was kind of a rare non-comedic film for him, but it was fascinating. Um, but then there are movies that are not overtly about numbers, but they are just rife with nu numerology. C can you give me um, uh, an example? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you want me to do it now, or yeah, let's just talk. We have about a minute here, and then we'll. Uh, yeah, that's then we'll... fine. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there, there. Uh, I always look for numbers. Numbers are are very good because um, numbers really don't lie. Now they can have multiple meaning. Um, we can take a look at like a movie, um, like such as Mother with Jennifer Lawrence, where the number eight is pervasive. Um, that has a lot of occult meaning. That deals with Gnosticism. That deals with um, the eighth level of, uh, it's, it, it has to do with uh, the, the eighth level, uh, what they call it, the hermetic spheres, where Sophia lives. And if, if you watch Mother, um, the Jennifer Lawrence character represents Sophia. And everything in the house is eight-sided. Everything, the doorknobs, everything. So something like that would be something that is is very relevant. The number would be relevant. Um, the number eight it has is, is one that has loads of esoteric meaning. Um, it denotes time travel. Um, when you take the number take the number eight and flip it on its side, um, it's the Lemnus Gate. It's the symbol for infinity, time manipulation. And of course, oh, that's that really cool. Yeah, we see that in Back to the Future. Right. Uh, with how Martin. long did how long did how many times did you have to watch Mother before that jumped out at you, or did you spot that right away? You go, ah, this is... that one. No, I spotted that one right away. That oh. one, that that one was very apparent to me. You're very um, clever, very clever. Yeah. Robert, stay with us. We'll take sure. a quick time out. Robert W. Oh. Sullivan, the Fourth Cinema Symbolisms, Volume One through Four, and uh, we'll uh, we'll continue to delve into the occult symbology encoded. And some of your favorite movies. Back with more in a moment. Don't go away. The truth. Hey there, I'm hard at work on another edition of Inner Sanctum, my free monthly newsletter. Inner Sanctum features my monthly brief, a column of my thoughts and opinions on what's happening in the world. It features a spotlight on a past guest, a look ahead to an upcoming episode of my weekly syndicated radio program, The Conspiracy Show. It features a look at this month in conspiracy and UFO history and my Conspiracy Unlimited podcast episode pick of the month and so much more. To get your free monthly newsletter, Inner Sanctum, delivered to your email inbox, just go to my website, strangeplanet.ca, strangeplanet.ca. Scroll down to the bottom of the page and click Click on Inner Sanctum and register. It's fast, easy, and again, absolutely free. This is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. Follow Richard on Twitter at Richard Serrett. For show information, visit the website strangeplanet.ca. The truth will set you free. 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 But first, it will really tick you off. Welcome back to Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. From Zuma Radio. To talk to Richard, call 416-360-0740 or toll free 1-866-740-4740. We are back with Robert W. Sullivan the Fourth, and we're talking about uh, symbol symbolism in cinema. Uh, we were talking about numerology, and you mentioned the mother, uh, the movie Mother with Jennifer Lawrence. Um, can you give us another example? And then I want to then we'll move on. I want to talk about uh, Halloween Kills. We have Robert. Did we lose Robert? Hmm. Richard? Yes, there you oh, are. Sorry about that. No worries. Um, 
no, the yeah, no, I, I heard your questions, no problem. The um, the the um, numbers. Um, so we we talked about mother. So we would go into another movie that I would I would give a great example of. This one would be um, Black Swan. Uh, the movie I mentioned earlier. Um, this has one of the best ones of them all. Um, very subtle. It's when Natalie Portman uh, is arriving. This is near the beginning of it. Um, is arriving at the ballet uh, school and she looks up on the wall and there's a huge poster with Winona Ryder on it. Um, and of course, she plays Beth McIntyre, who is the ballerina being forced out of retire, being forced into retirement. Excuse me. And um, the uh, there's a date on it. And the date is uh, February 12th, um, and it's noticeable. Um, and that is completely intentional. Um, that is a reference to the birth date of a Russian ballerina named Anna Polova. Um, and if you research her, um, she crafted a dance called the Dying Swan that revolved around uh, Tchaikovsky's Swan Lake, of course, and Black Swan. You know, that's what the whole movie's about, is right. Swan Lake. And... Um, uh, her, her ballet was called The Dying Swan, and of course, it's it's very symbolically appropriate because that's exactly what Winona Ryder is. She's the dying swan. Uh, she's the, uh, you know, re retiring ballerina who tries to kill herself um, and, and, and is forced into retirement. And when you watch the movie um, and you watch the end credits of it, uh, Winona Ryder is actually credited as Beth McIntyre, the dying swan. So when you see something like that, then you know, okay, you know, we're, we're really dealing with someone here who is very adroit with this stuff, and uh, you know, the movies can the movies going to be overloaded with 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 symbolism and little themes and Easter eggs and things like that. So um, numbers are great, and I always look for numbers. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of times, not all the time, but a lot of times, they can definitely tip a director's hand uh, to. Um, to, to what he's going for or what she's going for in a particular film. Now, most people aren't going to catch that stuff. I mean, you are uh, incredibly skilled at it and very, I mean, your knowledge is so vast and deep. Uh, why do they then bother to put that in there? If I would say probably what, 99% of the audience is, is, is going to be lost on them. Right. It, 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 it. It, it's for several reasons. One is, and, and this is what I, I say in, in the thing, it can work on a psychological level. Um, you, even though you, you're, you're not, um, and this is when you get into the archetypes and with Carl Jung, even though you may not be picking up on it um, consciously, it can resonate subconsciously. Um, so, you know, you know, it, it's twofold. One is, you know, it can work on a psychological subconscious level. The other thing is, and, and this is, this is, you know, what, what I, I, I like, you know, which is one of the, another reason motivation for it is, um, it's there and it, it's like a game of chess. I mean, they're challenging you, the viewer or me, or, you know, whoever's watching the movie to keep an eye out for this stuff. And it turns the movie really into something more than just, you know, like you said, like a popcorn movie or a piece of celluloid. It's, it's, but putting these little esoteric undercurrents and Easter eggs in movies, I believe that it, it ele elevates the film. It turns it into mythology. And, um, you know, it's eventually discovered. Someone picks up on it. I picked up on it. You can read about it in the book. Um, you know, and like I said, the, the one thing that, you know, for me, a lot of times is, um, you know, I've watched certain movies loads and loads of times. And, and no matter how many times I watch them, I always seem to see something new in them. Um, so, you know, you know, when you're watching a movie um, and you become aware of it, you know, keep an eye out for this stuff. Um, it, it, it's, it will enlighten you as to what, you know, to maybe a deeper understanding of what the movie is trying to convey. All right. So you mentioned you, you've recently seen Halloween Kills. This came out probably a, well, Halloween 2021, the latest installment in the Halloween. I mean, how long is this? How many uh, this franchise has been going on? <laughs> um, uh, what is it like 20 films or 18 films, something like that? Yeah, the, I was born in 1971 and the first Halloween movie came out um, in 1978 like right around Halloween. So I was seven years old. Um, and here I am 50 years old now and I'm still watching Halloween and they're still making, and I'm still watching Halloween movies. Um, so yeah, this has been a franchise that, um, has been around for, for a while. What they, what they seem to be doing with these films, um, is, is they keep, they, they keep rebooting them and, and they keep erasing the storylines that have come before. So you have Halloween one, I mean, it's complicated. You have Halloween one, then you have Halloween two, and then you have Halloween three, which is sort of the ulterior universe. And then you have Halloween's four, five, and six, which, um, are a continuation of part two. 
uh, Halloween two, but then you get into Halloween H two O, which is which erases four, five, and six, <laughs> oh, Lord. And, which is which, which is which, which is a sequel to Halloween one, two, and three, and then the new ones that you have, and then you have the Rob, the two Rob Zombie films, and then you have Halloween two thousand eighteen, which is a direct sequel to Halloween nineteen seventy eight, which is erases everything else. Um, but what they what what the filmmakers have done with these is with with these last two and the third one coming out, which is Halloween Ends, um, don't hold your breath. Um, is 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 the movies these the, the last two Halloween eighteen and Halloween Kills? The, there are there are these references to all the other movies, um, and it's like these it's, it is kind of like a Mandela effect where it's like a, these parallel universes are bleeding in. To, to these most recent movies. I mean, you could see homages all over the place to Halloween 3 with the Silver Shamrock Mask, to Halloween 2 with the kid with the razor blade in his mouth. That's referenced a couple times. Um, the kid with the boombox, which is Lance Warlock's son who played uh, Michael Myers in part 2. You have an homage to that. Um, uh, Mrs. Elrond uh, with a ham sandwich is referenced. Um, uh, Halloween Resurrection, uh, which is the sequel to... Um, uh, Halloween H two O is is referenced in there one at one point. You see all these references to all the other movies um, coming out in these new ones, and and that's really interesting. And then the one thing that they've done with Halloween eighteen and this latest one, Halloween Kills, is they 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 reverse everything, um, and it's 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 not really anything sinister or I would even call it cult, but it does work as a great cinematic theme. Um, it's like, how many times can they do this? I mean, can they possibly do this? Um, where, you know, it's, it's, it, it started with 18 where, you know, Laurie Strode, this is Jamie Lee Curtis is the hunt, huntress hunting Michael Myers, who's now the hunted where of course this is reversed, you know, from the earlier movies where he's the guy stalking her. She's now stalking him. Um, and then we have in, in Halloween Kills, um, the bully in the original Halloween, Lonnie Elam. Uh, he is now being bullied at the beginning of Halloween Kills. So again, we have role reversal. Uh, in Halloween, the original one, we have the realtor trying to sell the uh, Myers house. Uh, Laurie Strode's father, Strode Realty, is trying to liquidate Meyer, the Myers house. In Halloween Kills, we have realtors living in the house. Um, not trying to live, not trying to liquidate it, but living in it. Um, so we have all this role reversal going on in, Hallow in Halloween. And then, of course, it wouldn't be Halloween if, if, if there wasn't a psycho reference in there. And, of course, we, we get into this with the very first one. I mean, you know, you know, the, the, there's a loads of psycho homages uh, in in um, the very first Halloween with John Carpenter, Deborah Hill. I mean, they were huge fans of the movie. I mean, you know, just, the, you know, Jamie Lee Curtis, the daughter of Jamie, you know, of uh, uh, Marion Crane, um, uh, Jan Janet Lee. Um, we have uh, the names of the characters. Sam Loomis is the boyfriend uh, from Psycho. Of course, this is Dr. Loomis, Donald Pleasance, who hangs around with a, a nurse named Marion. Um, you know, in, in Halloween. And, and then, of course, this carries forward in, in the Halloween Kills, where I guess I'm going to have to spoil it here, um, where Karen gets gets knifed to death at the end. That is a complete, um, almost scene-by-scene -scene, um, reshoot of the shower scene from Psycho, where Michael is stabbing um, Karen. This is a, a reshoot from Psycho, this, this shower scene in Psycho. And then, then, then they do one thing that's also very interesting at the end there, uh, Halloween Kills. At the, at the very end of it, when Michael um, is staring at the window and you can see his reflection in the glass, uh, you can very faintly see the, out, you know, the, the, the uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The um, silhouette? No, the um, reflection. Uh, no, the, you see the reflection, it's the uh, subliminal. Ah. Uh, that's the word I'm looking for. You can see the subliminal, the, the skull. Um, the 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 skull outline in the in the mask and and this of course ties into the original Psycho, where Norman Bates looks at the screen at the very end and, and you see the mother's skeletal remains superimposed over his and when and when you watch it in Halloween it, it looks like that it looks like you know the the the, the mummy of the mother superimposed almost over mm -hmm. Michael Myers so so we had that Psycho little you know Easter egg in there um, good stuff um, you know uh, very 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 well done. All right, we'll take another time out, Robert, come back and uh, uh, discuss more occult symbolism in cinema. Back with our discussion right after these. When in 
I don't need to tell you how important building and sustaining a healthy immune system is these days. And just in time, my good friends at Get The Tea are offering a special package called the Immune Builder. You get one month supply of Life Change Super Tea. That's eight bags. One bottle of Bio Aston. That's 75 capsules. Now, Bio Aston or Astaxanthin is known as one of nature's most powerful antioxidants and provides a wide range of impressive health benefits. The Immune Builder also includes one bottle of Potent C Wild Alaskan Sockeye Omegas. That's 90 gel caps. And one copy of the book, Natural Astaxanthin, Hawaii's Super Nutrient by Dr. William Sears. There's so much more than tea at getthetea.com. Get your immune builder right now. Not available in any store. Use the code UNLIMITED and all your purchases ship for free. The Immune Builder from getthetea.com. Ladies and gentlemen, the captain has turned on the fasten seatbelt sign. We're now crossing a zone of turbulence. Please return your seats and food trays to their upright position and make sure your carry-on luggage is safely stowed. You're about to leave everything you know behind. This is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. Strange Planet. With Richard Serrett from Zoomer Radio. To speak with Richard live, call 416-360-0740 or toll free at 1-866-740-4740. And we are back and we'll also take questions and comments from our uh, YouTube uh, live chat and the Rumble live chat. If you've got a question for Robert W. Sullivan IV, film historian, researcher, and uh, the books, uh, Volumes 1 through 3 of Cinema Symbolism. He is currently working on Cinema Symbolism 4. Um, one thing I learned from you, I've learned lots of things from you, Robert, over the years, but uh, the, the, um, the historical figure, John D., is a member of Queen Elizabeth I's court, and he was kind of her spy, I guess, spy master. He was in many ways sort of the what the in, in the inspiration for James Bond and W Double O Seven. Yeah, absolutely. He he is a very interesting character, and he turns up in media all the time. And not only that, he turns up at the uh, uh, during uh, the entertainments of the time. Uh, yeah, he was the, her court astrologer, um, and he's a spy. Uh, he, her spy master was Walsingham, but. Um, he definitely went into the Holy Roman Empire on her behalf to try to undermine Rudolf II and the Holy Roman Empire. Um, probably he is most well known for um, summoning these angelic hierarchies, these angelic beings, um, you know, that, that, you know, they run parallel. They, they're the guardians of the Sephirah and Kabbalah. Um, they guard the celestial hierarchies in Christianity. Um, you can equate them perhaps to the archons in, in Gnosticism, but they're angelic beings. Um, and of course, he wanted to gain wisdom from them. And uh, he is a what you would call a Kabbalist. Um, I mean, he's a Christian Kabbalist. It's, it's definitely a Christian interpretation of the Hebrew Kabbalah, um, where where it's it's like I said, you have these Christian angelic hierarchies um, that he is communicating with for you know for universal knowledge. And uh, uh, he's an astrologer. He was you're correct. He was Queen Elizabeth's court astrologer. Um, very interesting character, mathematician. Um, and uh, but you know he 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 you know he he is the attack of the Counter Reformation. He, uh, he he was attacked um, by Christopher Marlowe, um, who whether he was actually an agent or not was certainly doing the uh, Jesuits' um, bidding. Uh, I mean he he is completely undermined in Faustus, um, the Marlowe play, which which presents Don uh, John D. Excuse me, as a black magician. Um, and, uh, you know, D's philosophy underlies the Rosicrucians, I should point that out. Um, and again, uh, Kabbalah, um, Christian Kabbalah was also attacked by the Jesuits um, as, as heretical. Um, one, one of the things in, 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 in Faustus that, that does that is where 
Faustus summons Mephistopheles, and and Mephistopheles appears as a, uh, a, a mon like a demon, a monster, and he says, "Oh, don't don't look like that. Come back as something more calmly, so something you know that I can accept." He says, "Come back as a dressed as a Franciscan friar," and Mephistopheles does. Um, and he comes back dressed as a Franciscan friar. That is a reference. So, you know, you, you, you know this, I'm putting this out to show you how far this occult symbolism in media goes back and entertainment goes back. When Mephistopheles returns as the friar, that is a reference to a real life Franciscan friar named Francesco uh, Giorgi, um, who was uh, one of, wrote one of the first books about Christian Kabbalah. So um, the implication is that, be, you know, that Kabbalah is actually demonism, that it's actually, you know, uh, you know, satanic, um, and D by default is doing the bidding of Mephistopheles. Of course, we have the real rehabilitation with D um, via two ways with uh, uh, Spencer's uh, Fairy Queen, the Red Cross Knight, is John D, and then most famously Prospero in the Tempest, um, the White Magician, the benevolent White Magician, um, Shakespeare Bacon, whoever you want to say, um, is also personifies John D. Um, so you have this sort of competing, you know, where where Marlowe is portraying D um, as as the evil figure, and then Shakespeare is portraying him as the supreme White Magician. Um, and 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 like I said, whether Marlowe is an agent of the Jesuits or not, he certainly is doing their bidding. Um, if you look at some of his other plays. Um, Tamburline is an attack on Queen Elizabeth herself, um, and uh, the Jew of Malta is an attack on her physician, Rodrigo Lopez. Um, so he was really trying to undermine a lot of the Elizabethan re Renaissance. It's no wonder that he was killed at 29 in a, in a barroom fight. Likely, the story goes within the world of conspiracy by Elizabethan and agents at the behest of Queen Elizabeth um, because he was trying to undermine, you know, the Elizabethan capitalistic renaissance. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Dee is a fascinating character, but you will find him in the entertainments uh, of the time. Um, and like I said, you know, the, you know, the, the use of occult symbology in theater movies predates Hollywood. Um, and the examples I just gave you is a great example of this. So where where does John D and James Bond like was John D's symbol 007? Right, that's it. Um, when 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 he would go to when he would go on a spot, you know, when he was in the Holy Roman Empire, and he'd write a, a correspondence um, to 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 Queen Elizabeth, he would sign it 007, 007. Um, and it's actually meant to look like spy glasses. It's a zero, zero, and then a line over them with a line down the sign. It looks like the number seven. And of course, the, the symbolism of the eyeglasses was that he was her eyes only. The communication was for her eyes only. He was her eyes in the field. Um, so yeah, he was uh, a spy master as well, or you know, one of her spies reporting to her Walsingham. Um, part of this, if you, if you look at it, he's part of this sort of... Um, what you would call a, a Protestant esoteric, you know, I, I dare use the word Rosicrucian spy ring um, that was sort of combating the Catholic League. Um, it was, it was, it was, you know, combating the Jesuits who were, you know, doing the bidding of the, uh, you know, the, of the Roman Church. They were forming sort of the opposite, this Protestant sort of spy spy ring around Queen Elizabeth to sort of frustrate the Jesuits. Um, if you look at, you know, if you read between the lines of history, sort of beneath the surface, that's going on. That's what's going on with the, you know, some of the other members involved with this would have been Kelly. You know, Edward Kelly, the guy who helps him conjure the angels, Walsingham, Giordano Bruno, um, Drake, uh, Sir Walter Raleigh, people, Edmund Spencer, people like that, who are sort of creating this cult, uh, you know, this Protestant mystical cult around Queen Elizabeth to sort of combat, you know, the hermeticism, the darker hermeticism of the Jesuits. All right. We'll take one final time out, come back, and uh, we'll, take two, we'll take some questions from our uh, live chat and also... Over the phone, 416-360-0740 and the GTA toll-free from just about anywhere, 1-866-740-4740. Back with more. Curiosity. As you're staring up at the night sky, ever wonder who's staring back? You're listening to Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. With Richard Serrett from Zoomer Radio. 
All right, Robert, before we dive in, we've got lots of great questions coming up on the uh, live chat. Uh, give us the website where we can follow your work. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Richard, again, for having me on the Conspiracy conspiracy Show tonight. My website is my name. Uh, my name is Robert W. Sullivan IV, and my website is just that. It's www.robertwsullivan, and then the letter I and the letter V for the fourth, robertwsullivaniv.com. Links to buy my books, information about me. Uh, it's a very easy site to navigate. Go there, um, you know, for all, all, you know, for up, you know, updates by me, you know, shows I'm going on. www.robertwsullivaniv.com. All right, MG in the live chat asks, Robert, are you fam familiar with the shows Outlander and Rubicon, and can you share thoughts on symbolism in these shows? Uh, I am not familiar with either show, and I do not talk about movies or TV shows that I have not seen. All right. Uh, Thinker asks, is there any symbolism in the movie Gemini Man with Will Smith? Uh, I have not seen it, so I could not comment. All right. Uh, Breaking the Image asks, why didn't more of the public, if many or any at all, not recognize the symbolism in film over the century? And why not more? I'm not sure what he means by a public outcry. Uh, I think, again, he's 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 maybe thinking that there's some sort of sinister mo uh, when we when we hear a cult. And we hear symbology embedded. He's thinking that there's some nefarious purpose to it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there can be some of it does is, is dark, but um, you know, it's it's uh, to my understanding, it's it's a relatively new um, study. I mean, you know, I, I, my my the, the cinema book, <coughs> well, the Royal Arch of Enoch came out in 2012, ten years ago, um, and and to my knowledge, like you know, some of the movies I analyzed in that, I, that was a Masonic book, a Masonic history book. But I took on some of the Masonic films. Um, to my knowledge, that was one of the. I mean, that's one of the first ones that ever analyzed National Treasure as a Masonic movie, as being a, a Masonic ritual on screen. So it's a relatively new study, but. Um, you know, you know, like subliminals, the use of subliminals, that's all been, you know, you know, banned because that, that has to do with advertising. Um, but they do it in movies, but it's usually like product placement. Um, so, you know, it can, it can be nefarious, but it, it can also, you know, be um, interesting. It can be, you know, you know, if you, if you read the Renaissance philosophers, um, you know, uh, the, the presentation of the archetypes, although subconsciously they viewed it as a form of divinity. So, um, you know, it, it doesn't always have to be nefarious. All right. Toxic Canadian asks, so this is a, a favorite I know. Uh, yeah, we've talked about I this in the past. Yeah. Eyes wide shut. Uh, yeah. Some of, a quick analysis. Quick analysis. Right. This is Kubrick's swan song. He is, uh, Stanley Kubrick is very adroit uh, when it comes to symbolism. Um, I talk about uh, loads of his movies in my books, Eyes Wide Shut being one of them. I believe I talked about that in Cinema Symbolism too. Um, pay attention to the Christmas lights. Um, they're very bright. They're very gaudy. Uh, they turn up throughout the film when the Tom Cruise character is, is con being confronted with all the ills that plague society, whether it be child trafficking, pornography, prostitution, drug abuse. When he gets to the summer, the, the Summerton mansion where the Illuminati hangs out, there are no Christmas lights. That's done on purpose. That's to convey that this is really sort of the higher, you know, the, the, the evil, you know, above the petty evil that he's already shown you. Um, there's lots of symbolism going on um, in, in the ritual, the magic circle. Uh, Kubrick uses repetition. I, we won't have time to get into it, but he repeats things in his movies all over the place. I'd wide shut is no exception um, with the magic circle that turns up at the end. Um, the guy red cloak kiss the magic circle left uh, backwards, which is black magic. Uh, the, the music that's playing is being played backwards. Um, that of course conjures the exorcist. Anytime, you know, you, you hear backwards English uh, or, you know, the language being backwards. And again, he's trying to make this evil. He's trying to convey evil. Um, to 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 the viewer with 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 the Summerton uh, residents, um, that's just a brief overview of it. Um, it's it's a very intense movie, um, and it's something I, I analyzed in CS two. All right, uh, we've talked about this before, but since we're on the subject of Kubrick, and and um, you mentioned The Shining earlier, um, there are those who who believe that Kubrick was trying to relay in the movie The Shining that the Apollo moon landing, Apollo 11 moon landing was a hoax. 
and that he was the one that filmed it on a soundstage somewhere in the desert. And so he was using symbolism in The Shining to let the cat out of the bag. Can you talk about that? Yeah, there's there's probably some truth to this. Whether it was a hoax or not is is debatable. Did, did, you could craft the argument that they actually went to the moon, but they couldn't film there. Um, and, you know, of course, this is the scene in The Shining where the boy, Danny, stands up wearing the Apollo 11 uh, sweater, you know, with Apollo 11, and it goes to room 237. Back in the late 1970s, the moon was 237,000 miles to the Earth, from the Earth. So this is Kubrick showing you that he filmed the moon, the moon landing or staged it in a sound studio. Um there's ample evidence that this might be the case. I mean, certainly if you look at his earlier movies like Strange Love and 2001, um, you could see where Kubrick would have been could have been retained to do this based on the cinematography of the, of that of those two movies. But one of the real smoking guns in this is the movie that he made before The Shining, Barry Lyndon. Um, and this is something I talked about in CS3. I wasn't aware of it. I became aware of it. Um, he actually used, Kubrick used NASA technology uh, to film that movie. He wanted to film uh, the movie via, via candlelight, which couldn't be done. It was too dark. You could light a candle, but you always had to have an, an, an outside source, like a spotlight or something. Um, it didn't work. It always came out too dark. Uh, NASA had developed lenses that allowed you to do this, and Kubrick was given access to these lenses uh, to film Barry Lyndon. I mean, it just begs the question, you know, I mean, how is it possible that Kubrick, you know, has an in with NASA, uh, you know, to get these len lenses to film Barry Lyndon? Um, and the question kind of answers itself when you start thinking about it. Well, if, I mean, if he was able to borrow, you know, lenses from NASA, I mean, he must have had contacts there and he must have worked for them or, or knew somebody. Um, so it adds that, you know, yeah, I mean, maybe he really did, uh, you know, film film this footage for NASA of the guys hopping around on the moon in a sound studio. I mean, you, you, you can argue it one of two ways. You could say it was a hoax and they didn't go. Or you could also create an argument that they actually did go to the moon, but they just couldn't film there. So they had Kubrick, you know, film, film the guys jumping around on the sound stage. And when you couple that with the imagery and the shining, and then the knowledge, you know, of Barry Lyndon with the NASA lenses. And then, that, you know, he made these movies where you can clearly see, you know, Co you know, if, if you watch 2001 and, and Strangelove, you know, and you're, you work for NASA, you could say, OK, you know, this is the guy we want to hire. So um, it's certainly probable. I mean, it's, it's not, I don't think, any more uh, a weird conspiracy theory. Um, I definitely think it's probably more likely than not that Kubrick was the guy, in fact, who did film. Uh, the guys hopping around, you know, in, in a sound studio. And and with Wide Shut, his swan song, and, you know, you've heard the theories that he was murdered and that he was, what, what do you make of this idea that, that in that movie he was trying to to tell us about the existence of these secret societies and this powerful sort of Illuminati type group? Yeah, I mean, it, it's certainly possible um, whether, whether, you know, it, you can argue it both ways because you do have it. Um, you know, you do have it there on the screen for, you know, everyone to see. Um, you know, the, on the other hand, the movie does come out. Um, the movie's not suppressed or anything. Um, true, Kubrick does die right around its release. Um, in the end, the movie does come out, though. So, I mean, you could always say, well, if, if you know, he was trying to expose this, why would the movie even come out? Um, but no, I, I, I tend to agree with you. He definitely, um, I mean, is showing you this 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 sort of bleak group Um you know, that is sort of the puppet masters, you know, running everything from behind the scenes. Um, you know, did this cause his death? Did this, you know, contribute to his death? Did this make him a marked man? I mean, well, we may never know, but, you know, it's irrefutable that he dies um, right when that movie comes out. So make of it as you, as whatever you want to. Just like uh, we just have a couple minutes here. Just talk sure. briefly about um, this is another uh, film technique, and that is occult casting. Right, right. This is this is a favorite of mine, and and, and this is really sort of a memory mnemonic, um, where where what they will do is, um, and this is very expansive, um, and this can be done with with props and images. Where they, what you're asking me about is this is where they where where a studio will retain an actor or an actress, put them in a movie to draw in sort of their cultural baggage from an earlier work and invest this new work with the atmosphere, the imagery, um, the je ne sais quoi, if you want, um, from this earlier movie. 
you know, an example, some examples of this would be Max von Sido in the first, in, in the episode seven, um, uh, the force awakens von Sido's presence in that movie. We probably don't have time to get into it. It's clearly draw is, is clearly designed to draw in the first Dune movie from 1984 in the exorcist. Um, what are some other ones? Uh, Anthony Zerby in the second Matrix movie, um, his presence in that is designed to evoke uh, the Omega Man and and his and his his some of his dialogue in that. Um, uh, Catherine Ross in Donnie Darko is designed to conjure uh, uh, the Graduate with Dustin Hoffman um, and, and and bring in some of the themes from the graduate into Donnie Darko. Um, it's very psychological. It's very subconscious. Um, it works very effectively though. Um, and, and they do it with actors, they do it with actresses and they also do it with props. Um, and it can be, it, it's, it's when they do it with, with props and, and with actresses, it, it is, it's a form of a, a cult mnemonics. I call it a cult casting. It's really a form of the art of memory where they're using this imagery to draw in something else. Um, uh, but it's, it's right. very, it's very potent. Robert, we're going to have to leave it there. Robert W. Sullivan IV for the fourth. Robert W. Sullivan IV.com, the website. We look forward to Cinema Symbolism number four. And I, I know you're kind of reworking some of the other ones. Always a great pleasure, Robert. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. All right. That's it for me. My thanks to Carlos and Ryan. I'll be back next week with a brand new program. In the meantime, don't be afraid. There's nothing concealed that won't be revealed and nothing hidden that won't be made known. What you hear in the dark, speak in the light. What I say in a whisper, proclaim from the housetops. Move over, Aphrodite. I'm coming home. Good night. A new Richard Serrett's Strange Planet drops every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Subscribe at strangeplanetpodcast.com. Hey, tis the season to give the perfect gift. C60 Evo organic oil elixirs and facial serum sets. And here with another sleep tip is our good pal, Chris Burroughs, co-founder and chief scientist at C60 Evo. Hey, Chris, welcome back. Richard, thank you so much for having me. My my next tip uh, regarding getting better sleep is related to electronic devices. So so we all have these, this cell phone lying around or we're using it on a regular basis. What a lot of people don't realize is that those devices give off blue light. That blue light is actually tells our bodies. The, the only time naturally that we see blue light is at the peak of the sun. So when the sun is up at its peak at noon. And so what those devices do, including your computer terminals, uh, your cell phones, your tablets, is they convince our physiology that it's the middle of the day. You can imagine that if you're watching your cell phone or tablet at 10 p.m. and you've somehow convinced your, your, your physiology that it's the middle of the day, this is not good for sleep. So it's really important. Most devices have actually blue light blockers and you can just go out and Google and you know how to blue light block on my Samsung device or Apple device. Uh, or even on your, your PC or, or your Mac. Uh, make sure you turn that on. Uh, I know people who leave it on all day uh, so that they're never impacted by that blue light. I would recommend two hours before the sun is setting in your local area to turn that on. Obviously it doesn't work if you're working on videos or you're working on pictures, but try and turn that on two hours early. And the other thing regarding electronic devices, try to keep them out of the bedroom. Uh, I recommend that you actually put a charging station outside of your bedroom so that you just don't even bring it in your bedroom. Um, these devices, as we've kind of been reading and hearing, are, are like geared to trigger our uh, endorphin responses. And so we like to be on them. They keep them up. So uh, keep it out of the bedroom and make sure you got your blue light blocker on about two hours before the sun sets. And I, I always like sharing, sharing sleep tips because uh, our most consistent testimonial for our product is that people take it in the morning. They report mental focus and energy during the day and then better sleep that night. C60 Evo products deliver noticeable benefits to people and pets around the world. Immunity boost, deeper sleep, just like Chris said, more energy, mental balance, flexibility, and longevity. Please visit the website c60evo.com slash Richard hyphen Serrett. And don't forget, use the coupon code EVRS at checkout, EVRS at checkout, and then you save an extra 10%. That can't wait. All right, Chris, we'll talk again next week. Thank you. 
A new Richard Serrett's Strange Planet drops every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Subscribe at strangeplanetpodcast.com.